Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 65. You visit the earth and water it. You go- <laughs> It gets better. Uh, uh, You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their corn, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with corn. They shout and sing together for joy. Well, I did pick this because it is a harvest festival weekend. And it's great to take the opportunity, of course, to be mindful of our God, to be mindful that it is him who uh, brings bounty into our lives through the bounty of the earth, and we're thankful for it. Uh, we don't make much so much of the produce, it's we're wanting to make much, of course, of God. And so let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, you are our creator God, but you're also our sustainer God. And this weekend, we want to honor that aspect of you as we're mindful of the harvest We're thankful for all that it uh, means to us in practical and meaningful ways. We're thankful for the many hands that labor uh, toward bringing a harvest in. Uh, We pray that you'd be a sustaining grace for each of our farmers. Be that sustaining grace and encouraging grace to us this morning as we come and worship before you. And and we thank you for all your good and perfect gifts. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for joining us this morning. We do have a few people away, and as I'll make mention of later and pray for, uh, we've got some people that are suffering as well, some illness as well. But thank you for those of you who are here. And we have an opportunity to make much of our uh, great and sovereign King this morning. I want us to recite the Lord's Prayer together. I thought as well, it's, it's great on a harvest weekend to express our thanks and through the prayer that the Lord gave us. So Yes, thank you, Stuart. And follow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Indeed. Our reading this day is found in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And I'll read uh, verses 22 uh, to 35. And this is God's word. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, They themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, uh, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. 
So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Lord, on this uh, Harvest Festival weekend, we're, I trust, mindful uh, more of you than we are even of your good gifts, but indeed you do say, and we see so much evidence of the truth that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Think of Peter, who says that you give us all things pertaining to life and godliness, and that is a wonder, because who would we be without you? How could we ascend the hill of the Lord without you? We need you to be our godliness. We need you to put your spirit in us so that we could be right with you. You give us all things pertaining to life as well. And one of those things is, of course, your word. You sent your word and it healed us. You sent your word. It divides soul from spirit. It gives us understanding. It gives us perspective upon everything. It's the lens through which we can judge all matters of life here on earth. And we thank you that this morning we know that you not only have sent it, but you uh, uphold us through it. We thank you the, that you watch over it. You watch over it to perform it, your Bible tells us. And we thank you that it will do its work, its mighty work in our lives today. Help us to sit under it such that we are not the authority over it, but it is your word that has authority over us. Help us to submit our souls, our heart, our mind to the truth of your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So again, we're in John chapter 6. Uh, we're doing a series in a way of um, unusual for us, as we typically would work uh, sequentially through a book. Our Daniel series, as I said from the onset, was going to be short, uh, three parts. We've done two of those parts. Given that we now have Harvest Weekend and then I am away for a couple of weeks, we'll have some one-off ministry. But very thankful for the ministry that we will have. Next Sunday, for instance, Josh Harrison will be joining us uh, from Little Hill Church. So I appreciate Josh's friendship and his ministry. Uh, most of you know well Josh, and uh, he's a wonderful minister and a godly man and a godly friend, so please do support uh, him and come out next week and, and be ministered to. Um, <clears throat> I will pick up that third idea that I have from Daniel chapter 1 before we start our series in Ezra and Nehemiah in October. But today, I thought... For Harvest Weekend, John chapter 6 is a wonderful uh, chapter, I think. Harvest festivals are, of course, common throughout the world. In the UK, we see it as a chance to thank God, don't we? Thank God for uh, the gift, of course, of this year's farming harvest. Um, you probably know in North America, I'm, I'm from Canada, of course, we call it Thanksgiving. That would be our harvest festival really making quite explicit what the purpose of the festival is. It's to give thanks to God. Now, as we examine our lives, as we examine our lives, how easy is it for you? I'll be really particular. How easy is it for you to be thankful? I've talked before about how we always encouraged our children to be thankful at the end of the day, to recount even say two things of your day 
for which you can be thankful to God. It's a really good habit to develop. But I know as adults, <clears throat> and I know even my now adult children, it's not always easy to be thankful, is it? And so I want us to perhaps examine what might cause us to be challenged in our thanksgiving. I think we're going to see two things simply from this passage, even if it's not easy to live out. One, Jesus confronts our motives, and two, Jesus offers us life. The context is, is quite fascinating. So uh, we have picked this up on the next day as verse 22 says, do you know what happened that previous day? It was no small thing. It was the feeding of the 5,000. And then we know that there is a short description John gives of how Jesus takes himself to Capernaum and he does it by walking on the water. John says, ultimately, there are so many signs they could fill books and books and books. I've, I've sh chosen to share a few of them with you. Well, he gives pretty short shrift to walking on the water, joining his disciples along the way. The next day, as we pick it up in verse 22, there were some from the crowd that had remained or returned from other boats from Tiberias. The news was spreading. A crowd is seeking Jesus, verse 24 tells us. And this sounds so promising, doesn't it? A crowd of people seeking Jesus. Well, there's something about a crowd, isn't there? Something about a crowd. When we see one, don't you assume there's some reason for it? Like, can you really leave a crowd alone? If you're minding your own business, you're walking the pavement, and then around the corner on another pavement, there's a crowd developing. Don't you just want to see what it's all about? There's something about crowds. They're there for a reason, usually. It's a sign of excitement and vibrancy of life and strength. Of course, crowds can also be a source of identity for us, aren't they? Look who I follow. Look at the crowd that I follow or that I run with. Or even look who follows me. Oh, if you have that kind of crowd, that's interesting. Well, Christian ministry, I think of all sorts, all too often looks for and at crowds in unhealthy ways. And so what does Jesus do with this crowd that gathers toward him? Well, maybe first see what he doesn't do. Notice that he doesn't quickly jump to pray with them. Hey, they were seeking Jesus. He doesn't do that, though. He doesn't list them for, enlist them for service. He doesn't immediately put them on a member's roll. He actually gets borderline offensive. He gets straight to the point and puts a finger on their motives. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So these are people that had been with them yesterday. They had been part of that mass crowd that had been fed. And Jesus looks past. He's able to see past a gathering crowd and look more intently and more purposefully and more importantly at their motives his gaze penetrates right to the heart we're so superficial aren't we we look on things externally we assess things outwardly and i think if we're honest we would look at a crowd very differently than jesus does now he acknowledged the seeking but he questioned the motive. He tells them they came not because you saw signs. That's an interesting thing because seeking signs, the Bible tells us, isn't the height or pinnacle of maturity. Remember though the importance of signs for John's gospel. John lays out a series of signs and statements. This is actually one of the statements, one of the great I am statements that we studied 
uh, back, uh, I think my first autumn of ministry here. <clears throat> John uses these signs and, and statements as a way of putting Jesus on display, as it were. Who is this man called Jesus? And he puts it on display for a really good reason. He writes at the end of his book, these things, the ones that he has chosen, the stories he's chosen, the signs he's chosen, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. And so I think what Jesus is saying here, you didn't even come for signs because he knows if they had at least come for the signs, perhaps they would see the man behind the signs and then perhaps have life in his name, as John hopes. But they were neither led by a desire to feed upon Christ, nor even to follow him for the sake of his gifts. They merely wanted to be fed. They had had their fill yesterday. They had eaten as much as they wanted, the word tells us. And the next day, they were back for more. <clears throat> But that's the problem with natural life, isn't it? Without exception, it's infinite capacity to disappoint us. Now, I'm an eternal optimist in a way. That's just even before I was a Christian, I was a glass half full person. All right. I, sorry, I apologize for that. I know some of you aren't, but that's just the way God made me but I'm also a pessimist in the sense that this life is not satisfying. Ultimately, it always disappoints. If we put our ultimate hope in this life, even in the best things of this life, we'll be disappointed. As a pastor, I, of course, come alongside many of those disappointments. I think of people that you know, maybe with all the right intentions, put their hope in a relationship. I see wide-eyed young couples coming together for their marriage preparation, and you can see the idealism, you can see almost the idolatry that they have, that sense that marriage is so wonderful, it's gonna fix us. And if you're not a whole person going into a marriage, there's a good chance you're not going to have a wholly good marriage. Um, but even the best marriages struggle. The best marriages sometimes have illness we didn't plan on or even death. And if your hope then is in that really good God ordained thing called marriage, which is temporal, your hope will be dashed or can be. No, life has an infinite capacity to disappoint us. You know, your best round of golf, I haven't been golfing here because I didn't even take my clubs with me, but I used to golf quite a bit. And I can tell you, it's wonderful to have a good round, but you wake up the next morning wanting another one. I can be one stroke better. The next round of golf will be better. The best meal will still leave you hungry for more. We're on the rota. I mentioned the rota we do for students, and I said we're doing Turkish takeaway. Because why? Well, Turkish food is wonderful and luster, okay? We're spoiled for choice. And it'll be a wonderful meal, but we'll still want more. Maybe not in five minutes, but it wouldn't surprise me, especially with students, if it's maybe 25. <laughs> the best meal will still leave you hungry for more. C.S. Lewis put it really eloquently. He said, I cannot find a cup of tea which is big enough or a book that is long enough. Can't you imagine Lewis saying that? I can't find a cup of tea which is big enough or a book that is long enough. And the uh, Canadian actor Jim Carrey uh, said this, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that's not the answer. That's a very wise thing. I don't know if he's a Christian, but he's certainly someone who has come to the end of life in a way and realized 
I'm not satisfied with whatever I've tried so far. And so Jesus puts a finger on our motives, and he does it, though, with the best of intentions, because he knows if we're wrongly motivated, we'll be wrongly satisfied. Secondly, though, Jesus offers us true life. Jesus offers us true life, and we really see this in verse 27. I, I'm going to focus really on verses 26 and 7, but 35 as well. So verse 27 says, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. This is his answer. This is what he tells to these people that are wrongly motived. 35 says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So what's he saying here? <clears throat> well, I think he's saying that there's a new spiritual reality. He speaks of two kinds of bread, an unsatisfying natural bread that perishes, and a spiritual one that both satisfies and lives eternally. Um, I, I love bread. We don't eat as much bread, like many people. It's the carb thing, right? But uh, I love a good loaf of bread. And you really can only get a good loaf of bread if you buy sort of a non-commercial one that, without all the preservatives, right? But the challenge is it's not a great loaf of bread by even the third day. <laughs> Um, we know it perishes, doesn't it? it? It gets old. It's unsatisfying. But he speaks also of a spiritual one that both satisfies and lives eternally. It doesn't perish like natural bread. Now crowds, these crowds, they loved the miracle worker, the, the fish maker and the bread maker, the one who could give them the material things that they desired. But Jesus is telling them, I want to give you so much more than that. He doesn't begrudge giving because he is a giver. As I said before, God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. He's, he's not penurious and miserly. He so loved us that he gave his son. God is a giver. And God the Son loves giving and loves serving. But he's got so much more, he says, for us to receive. He wants to give them stuff, or he wants to, I think he's trying to lift up their eyes, to train their sight upon him rather on, than on these material things, so that then he could indeed bless them more thoroughly, more in a more satisfying way, feed their souls to satisfy those deepest hungers and thirsts. As we listen in on the conversation, we see that they're in a way talking past each other, don't we? Um, labor for the food that endures to eternal life is what Jesus says. But then they ask immediately following in verse 28, what must we do to be doing the works of God? So they hear that there's some work to do. We're to labor for the food that endures to eternal life. Okay, and tell us, what do we do what, to do the works of God? They, they immediately turn to doing, missing the fact that Jesus has already said, it's something I want to give you. I want to give this to you. But they think work immediately. It's not something they can earn. It's not something they can deserve by being better followers. It's something they need to receive as a gift. And he's also patient. If I was going to make a long pastoral aside, this might be a point to do it, but I won't do it today. But we all could learn from Jesus when he is. Maybe I'll say this. When we have these moments where we see Jesus ministering to people, there's so much we can learn. It isn't simply the doctrine of the moment. Learn the character of Christ as he ministers to people. And here I see patience, <laughs> really infinite patience. He says in verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is the work I'm talking about. You heard the word labor and you're immediately thinking like a human. 
like a proud human that can do its own work well enough that you'll earn the favor and the good gifts and blessings of God. It doesn't work like that, child. He says, I want to give this to you. This is the work of God, simply that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so they said to him, here's the conversation again, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? You're asking us to believe you. What sign do you do? What work do you perform? Now, I don't know about you, but that probably would have tipped me over the edge. <laughs> that would have been, okay, I'm no longer patient pastor. Um, don't you remember what I did yesterday? You want a sign? You want a work? You're here because of a sign and a work I did less than 24 hours ago. But he doesn't say that. We see, again, what sign do you do may we, that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, it's interesting that they've picked up on this, this idea of the manna from heaven in a way. That's what they, they've got on their mind when Moses, when they were wandering in the wilderness. And so they're looking for that kind of sign, I guess, that natural bread from heaven that they had uh, from God, providing uh, their sustenance when Israel was wandering. Came fresh daily, right? And they want this also. That's why they later say, give us this bread always, because that's what Moses was able to do. Come on, Jesus, you can do that as well, can't you? I mean, if you want us to believe in you, can't you at least do that? Give us this bread always. But, but again, we see Jesus' patience. He's correcting them gently, lifting up their sights higher. For one, he tells them, he teaches them that Regarding the man, it wasn't Moses. Get your eyes off of Moses. It was God the Father that provided that manna. And now the Father has again provided. And he's standing in front of you, the true bread from heaven. Well, I want to make it clear that it's not wrong to have bread. Okay, it's not wrong to have material things in general. We eat every day. <laughs> Today, we're thankful for the shelter that we have from the rain, aren't we? We are clothed. I think we're all thankful that we're clothed this morning. These are good things, and we ought to thank God for them. I also want to say it's not wrong to work. Jesus never, ever shows contempt for work. In fact, he affirms it. He said of his disciples, the laborer deserves his wages. Paul says, if anyone will not work, let him not eat. So yes, we work to meet our needs and we work to help meet the needs of others, our giving. But I think what Jesus is meaning here is similar to what he taught in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 19. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal. Because anything temporal that the heart can treasure, whether food or the stuff we own, that is what Jesus calls food that perishes. Even immaterial things like prestige and power and status, again, that is food that perishes. It does not fully satisfy your, here on earth and, and it's worthless at death. And it's useless on the judgment day when you stand before your creator and give an account for your life. In short, Jesus was not sent to give bread. He was sent to be bread, to be our full satisfaction. Uh, many of you know the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German pastor and theologian who opposed Hitler and the Nazi regime. Uh, when he was moved from a Nazi prison to the main Gestapo prison in 1944, he took that as a cue that my days are numbered. His time on earth was nearing an end. And so when he left that first prison, 
he said goodbye to his friends and it was remarkable they said that he seemed to be completely at peace completely at peace now i don't agree with everything bonhoeffer wrote every bit of his theology by any means but i think he was a remarkable undeniable witness for christ at a time when that was absolutely not easy one of his last messages out from prison testifies to how he found his satisfaction in Christ in spite of his circumstances. It was a poem entitled New Year 1945 and the third stanza reads like this. Should it be ours to drain the cup of grieving even to the dregs of pain at thy command we will not falter thankfully receiving all that is given by thy loving hand. That's someone who has rooted his satisfaction at what comes from the hand of God and not merely circumstantial, not merely those things that are comfortable and easy even. Should it be ours to drain the cup of grieving, even to the dregs of pain at thy command, we will not falter, thankfully receiving all that is given by thy loving hand. I think that's a really nice, the, the, last, um, the last part of that stanza, I think, is really critical to our understanding. It's, it, so much is wrapped into that by saying, all that is given by thy loving hand. It recognizing, recognizing God as giver, but recognizing God as good giver that his loving hand is what gives us things. And that is even those things that are hard. Everything that we have in our life shapes us. And we have to keep in mind that when we struggle, God has a higher purpose for us than we can see. So his project right now is to remake you. We're going to talk about this tonight as we look at humanity in our statement of faith. His project is to remake you into his image. That's what we're, that's the journey we are on. It's something we cannot do. It's something we did. We marred the image of God by our sin. And we can't undo that marring. The only way we can be remade into that image is by a work of God. And I came to a point in my life, and it, it was a freeing and liberating point, I can tell you, when I recognized that sometimes when I struggled, sometimes when I went through challenges, I actually wasn't walking by faith. And some of the struggle that I had in my struggle was because I actually wasn't seeing and trusting in a good, sovereign God that was remaking me into his image even the tough bits of life. And I can give testimony after testimony. We know of so many Christians that can speak to this, that I didn't understand it at the time, but now I, can, I have a different perspective after I got through my struggle um, in any number of ways, whether it's a deeper relationship with God, whether it's a greater level of maturity, a greater trust in God, whether it's a greater compassion when we struggle, we have compassion for others who struggle. I mean, it's limitless the lessons that we learn as we become more and more be or better uh, image bearers of God. Bonhoeffer, I think, was a man full of the spirit of Christ in, the, in a true sense of, of the word. It mirrors actually the kind of life that the prophet Isaiah spoke of. Um, don't have to turn here. I'll read it word by word. Verse, this is chapter 55, uh, verses 1 to 3, if you're taking notes. Isaiah prophesied, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come by and eat. Come by wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me and hear that your soul may live. Does that not sound a lot 
like Jesus um, about 600 years beforehand, but it sounds a lot like Jesus to me. Remember, I, I quoted verse 35 earlier. Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. These are the two things that are critical here. We have to come to him, and we have to believe in him. And so Jesus offers us true life. Will we receive it? That really is the closing question. He offers us true life. Will we receive it? He gives us this all satisfying, eternally satisfying bread. And this is really the one, one element, I shouldn't say the one, it's one element that sets apart Christ and the Christian faith. Man-made religion will tell us ways by which we can better ourselves, either for the approval of God or the betterment of our lives and circumstances. But this approach appeals really to either our senses or our pride. Our pride in that we can then do things that make us acceptable to God. Tips to make us better believers. Our senses in that when we believe it's God's job to make a pretty great life even better, even more comfortable and even more successful. But Jesus didn't come to be useful to us. He didn't come to be useful to us. He came to radically renovate us, to transform us from being dead spiritually to being alive in him. And so he says, if we're going to receive this, we're to come to him and we're to believe. And so what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to believe? I'll give you really three analogies here. Thinking about eating is not eating. Anyone agree with that? Would you have been happy just to think about eating last night? <laughs> I came early, of course, to help set up, and I was smelling the food for an hour and a half before we got to the food, and it wasn't enough to think about it. It wasn't enough to smell it, even. Thinking about eating is not eating. Knowing nutritional facts about food is not eating. We had a friend, a, a dear friend, um, that ultimately we lost sadly, but you know, she was so knowledgeable. She wanted to be so careful about everything that went in to her body, but sometimes she'd forget to eat. Knowing nutritional facts about food is not eating. Understanding how food is processed within your bodies, it's interesting, but it's not eating. And so the analogies I hope are obvious thinking about Jesus is not the same as believing. Knowing facts about Jesus is not the same as believing. Understanding how Jesus saves a person is not the same as believing. Believing in Jesus is staking your life on the fact that the only way to truly live is to receive him. Believing is placing all your hope in pleasing God and sustaining our lives is found in Christ and Christ alone. Believing is knowing and cherishing the truth that Christ's sacrificial life given for us is completely sufficient for giving us life instead of the death we deserve. Um, I'll close with this quote. It's, it was challenging, I'll admit, the first time I read it, but I, it's good. And so hopefully you won't be so challenged you'll write it off. Uh, James, uh, James Boyce was an American theologian. He said, is Jesus as real to you spiritually as something you can taste or handle? Is he as much a part of you as that which you eat? Don't think me blasphemous when I say that he must be as real to you as a hamburger and french fries. I say this, although he is obviously far more real than these. The unfortunate thing is that for many people, he's far less than that. That's so true, isn't it? 
I think, I know we don't believe that, we don't really think that, but sometimes the living out of our beliefs is challenging. And, and if we're honest with ourselves and some of the fears that we take on are actually rooted in not really believing this as deeply as we think we do. You know, I said I came to the point in life where I had to see the challenges of life differently. I'll tell you, I was already pastoring by that age. So that's maybe a shame to me, but um, I want it to be an encouragement to you. Um, if you still struggle with the struggles of life, um, do struggle to see beyond them, but know you're not alone. You don't struggle alone. Come and talk to me if you want someone to pray with or understand or encourage you, happy to do so. And, you know, in closing, we're a blessed people. And on Harvest Festival weekend, it's really good to be thankful to God for his bountiful provision. It's wonderful to share as well from that same provision. We bless because we've been blessed. But our thankfulness is not just a, a general feeling. There's an object to our thanksgiving. We're not just thankful because we got a nice life. The object to our thanksgiving is Christ. We're thankful for Christ and we're thankful in Christ. Thankful for that true life that he has given as our true bread. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I, I know we, we long to be thankful for, for all that you have given us. Um, and, and I see that in so many ways that uh, we, we are a people that are thankful for your good and perfect gifts in our lives. And yet each of us, if, when we're honest, we would sometimes struggle, um, struggle to, to maintain that thankfulness. Help us to understand those ways perhaps in, in which we have um, undervalued certain elements of, of cherishing you and perhaps put too much focus on the circumstances of life. Thank you that um, in spite of <laughs> all that I've just said, we know that you are our ever-present help in time of need. And so I do pray right now for those people that are in the middle of that struggle. Perhaps this is a more challenging message than they wanted to hear today. Um, Help them, Lord, be that ever-present help in their time of need. Help them to even phone a friend to say, could you pray with me? Could you encourage me? Could you read me something? But do help them to lift up their eyes because it's from you that comes their help. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our benediction today is uh, one of Paul's great prayers for the church. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Uh, go in his peace. You are loved. <clears throat>